All right, so we got a huge chapter this month. There was just so much that happened here aside from all the backstory because if I had to make a guess, it honestly seems like we're actually getting into end game territory here, right? I mean, to be honest, it does make sense to say that if father dies, then the story is pretty much over, right? Given that he is the main antagonist, but after this chapter, I feel like there's just so many pieces on the chessboard right now that I think even if father legitimately died here, that the story just couldn't be over. I mean, especially now after what we learned about Yato this chapter, there still seems to be something up with Arahabaki and we can't forget that father still has the brush he got from the underworld and just so many more things that are happening right now so let's just get into it we got a lot to talk about here but before I get into the actual chapter itself I should probably explain that this is actually my first Noragami chapter review I do intend to do more of these on a monthly basis here on the channel so if this is something you're interested in then make sure you like and subscribe depending on how well this video does I'll see about doing more than just Noragami chapter reviews maybe I'll also do some some discussion type videos or theories for Noragami because yeah I got a lot of those but I'll talk more about this at the end of the video so for now let's just get into the chapter. So the chapter picks up right from where we last saw father in his childhood and it turns out that he actually didn't kill himself with the Buddhist monk. It shows he actually resisted and pushes the monk off instead and considering the monk was going to die regardless of if father pushed him off or not I think the bigger picture here is that we're seeing the first moment when father decided to oppose the gods and I could be wrong here but my impression from the last chapter was that father was a adopted by this Buddhist monk and over time it looks like that he was actually teaching father the whole Buddhist way of life but when it came down to actually abandoning their human life to go and join the Buddha this was when father realized that he rejects not just the Buddha and his teachings but any and all gods so I guess from his perspective it was ridiculous to throw away his life for his faith when even his faith itself wasn't genuine and I get this specifically from when he says animals insects even plants exist in a constant state of competition in order to live that's all it ever is that's all it's ever been and I hate it and while we live these wretched lives there are those who just watch and I couldn't help but wonder why so I know there's a lot more to be explained still with how father was you know able to come back from the dead also who was the girl that we saw in his arms that died but again I think what we're being shown right now is that father has always opposed the gods since he was a kid this isn't something he discovered in his teens or as an adult and what's also interesting is that it seems like every character so far in origami has some narrative or background that relates to a parental figure I mean, there's Yato and his father, Yukine and his own, even Daikoku had a very rough experience trying to be a father, but when you look at father's backstory, it takes a very morbid twist on a boy who was adopted and then forced to kill himself. It's like the complete opposite of how Yato takes in Yukine as his own regalia, but considers him almost like his own son and only wants the best for him. And I can only see the rest of father's backstory turning more and more morbid, so hopefully next month we see what exactly happened during his death and who it was exactly that he lost. So after this it cuts back to the present time father's looking at Amaterasu and says you were watching right you knew of my crimes and yet you let me roam free and why is that so I think we ultimately find out later in the chapter why Amaterasu allowed him to do as he wanted for all these years but then suddenly Yatagarasu comes in and charges at him before he could attack her and we're seeing Yatagarasu in his three-legged crow form but even during their fight father talks about the gods secret around the other gods who have their shinky but these three gods decide to rush at him regardless even though we can clearly see that their shinky are starting to question the god's secret and then when Yatagarasu thinks he's open for attack he does like this fan attack with his wings at father that ultimately just wrecks the city itself rather than doing any real damage to father and then using the web from Hagusa's net he's able to catch him and then stab his side using Nora but then notice how Nora's actually helping him better than usual and then during this pause he starts talking to Amaterasu confessing everything he's done over the years to the near and far shores and says I am a necessary evil and then in the biggest moment this chapter we finally hear from Amaterasu and she says you're a little off the answer has already been divinated the necessary one is not you and then we get a shot of Yato so this is going back to what father had asked earlier I think when he tells her why did she allow him to exist despite her knowing his crimes and I think this is the answer that everything that's happened throughout all these years where it looked like he was the one playing chess while everyone else was playing checkers that all of this happened so that Yato could exist and this is mind-blowing we're seeing the main antagonist the puppet master himself go from mastermind to a martyr also that Yato could come into being essentially now in what way is Yato necessary I can only really make a guess right I mean from my interpretation it sounds like father was only barely necessary considering she tells him you're a little off so it seems like father in fact did have a role to play in whatever it is that Amaterasu was referring here to but it also sounds like when she's calling Yato the necessary one that she's referring to just Yato's existence in general now this is just my interpretation right I could be entirely wrong here and she could be referring to something entirely different 
in here instead but at the very least i want to assume that it means that yato holds a lot more importance than what we had originally thought and then i started thinking well in what way has yato's existence actually affected the story and the most immediate thoughts that came to mind were two things the blessed regalias which are kazuma and yukine and the second being hiyori because if you remove yato entirely from the noragami timeline then i don't think there would be any blessed vessels aside from nana since yukine would have never sacrificed himself for yato and kazuma would have never had asked yato to kill bishamon's own clan in turn giving kazuma and bishamon their time to you know rely on each other as they did so he could become a blessed regalia so if you remove yato entirely from the current history then i think there wouldn't be any current blessed vessels and given that we know that there are currently only two blessed vessels aside from nana who isn't even allowed to exist outside of her box then you can make the argument that yato's existence is absolutely massive and then i started thinking well if yato never existed then hiyori would have never gotten hit by that bus in the beginning of the story and throughout the entire manga we've seen hiyori able to interact with the gods she's even been able to attend the council meetings even being there when yato and bishamon were put on trial so it seems very obvious she's had a special privilege throughout the entire manga so with that said now i'm just really curious just what role does hiyori have in all this because she seems to be the only half phantom in the entire story and she is a main character so if she somehow has a greater role in this that only amaterasu knows then i could only wonder what that is and if it turns out that hiyori is a lot more important than we had realized then that is just like a mind trip right because who could have expected that i mean not even father considers her a threat and so far these are the only two things that came to mind but i'm sure yato's affected a lot more things than just causing you know hiyori into a half phantom and there being two blessed vessels i mean yato's been alive for a long time so it can't just be these two things right and after hearing this father looks just confused by it all but then amaterasu says for the unpardonable crime of returning from the underworld the sorcerer is sentenced to death so this is also very interesting because it sounds like amaterasu has no hesitation to kill him despite knowing that if father dies then so will yato and if that's always been the truth that if father dies then so does yato and if amaterasu knows this then why would she kill father after she just admitted that the necessary one is yato now like i've said already it sounds like when she referenced to yato as the necessary one it sounded like she meant that yato's entire existence was necessary but again i could be totally wrong here right but if i'm right and if she truly means to kill father here and now then does that mean that whatever it was that made yato necessary has already happened or already will happen regardless of if they live any longer or not and there could be just so many theories to this question i just don't know what to believe right now and after saying this it looks like we're seeing yato garasu straight up die here and this next part is so morbid when she looks at nora and then just goes one by one almost like she's taking her sweet time starting to break all the names on her and i don't really know how to explain it but this feels very discomforting like in a way that only makes sense in origami maybe it's just the way that amaterasu is so relaxed doing this and then it looks like this puts yukine under stress spreading his net even further and then it cuts back to abisu and take they're both noticing that they've lost one of their shinky's names and this next part is so funny when abisu tells him look we're basically brothers right so it's only natural that we share and then take is like oh i get it but do you have to put it that way but then they realize that they have to act like everything's normal in front of the gravekeeper and then when he goes back to talking about the mask maker we finally see father for the first time being shown to us and i mean we've seen father before a lot of times but it's like this is the first time we're actually being introduced to him so i can't wait for the next chapter guys it looks like we're finally getting into what could be the big answer on how father was able to return from the dead so i'm gonna end the video here guys thank you so much for watching i very much appreciate it and like i said earlier i will be doing noragami chapter reviews here on a regular basis just please if this is something that you're actually interested in then make sure you like and subscribe i think it would make me the only youtuber who's talking about noragami manga right now if i continue to make these chapter reviews so it would really mean a lot if you supported me in this i would very much appreciate it and who knows if this does well enough i'll consider doing more than just chapter reviews i mean this is currently one of my favorite manga at the moment i literally have all the volumes on my shelf so i'm a massive fan and i would love to talk about all my theories and discussions with you guys and like i said i don't think there's any youtuber covering the manga right now and i would definitely like noragami to get some more popularity because this current arc is just amazing but i'm gonna end it here guys again thank you so much for watching please like comment and subscribe let me know what you agreed or disagreed with and yeah have a nice day